Hello everyone, um, my name is Jamie and this is my talk on uh, hacking rental e-scooters uh, with some real world examples. Um, so just before we start, um, theft is theft. Um, everything I'm about to discuss is completely hypothetical. This talk will not tell you how to steal an IoT device or a scooter. Um, all of these devices were legally obtained from eBay, electronics recyclers, um, e-waste auctions and police auctions. And please don't go out attacking rental companies, um, they're the good guys in this situation here. So with that being said, um, let's just uh, get into it. Um, so first off um, on the agenda we've got uh, an introduction to shared micromobility um, where I'll basically just run through um, kind of you know what shared micromobility is. Um, next uh, I'll kind of go through my motivation um, and Next up, uh, kind of the, my first steps on actually dumping the device, um, modifying the firmware, um, and then kind of understanding the protocols that it speaks. Um, and then kind of my opaque IoT platform, so the platform that I built to kind of simulate a rental company. Um, and then next up is uh, some vendor app exploitation. Um, so we'll break into some vendor apps and actually get control over some scooters. Um, and then Second last is just some uh, vulnerabilities uh, and a demo. Um, these are hypothetical vulnerabilities. Um, and then some hypothetical attack scenarios and then we'll uh, finish off. So who am I? Um, my name's Jamie. Um, I'm interested in physical security, RFID, reverse engineering. Um, I've got about 12 plus years of experience in breaking stuff and not being able to put it back together. Um, and this is my first talk. So you know, please, please go easy on me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and my presenter notes aren't actually showing up um, on here for some reason, so this is uh, going to be fun. Anyway, you can find me on Twitter, um, at Jamie Duke, E. Um, so basically, what is shared micromobility? Well, shared micromobility has had a bunch of different iterations over the past 10 years. Um, so I'm sure everyone can remember um, kind of when we first saw the, this technology emerging. Um, we kind of saw it in uh, kind of docked bike solutions. Um, so these docks were just uh, fixed to the side of the street. Um, you'd walk up to a terminal, um, pay a few dollars, um, and then you'd ride away with the bike. And then the next sort of inter it, it, yeah. and then the next sort of iteration of that was um, the whole dockless bike sharing. Um, so I don't know if anyone remembers the e-bike and Ofo fiasco. Um, these things ended up absolutely everywhere, um, in, in trees, rivers, uh, on top of buildings. Somehow, just it, it became basically a game to put these bikes in funny places. Um, so. Then we kind of saw a shift away from um, like dumb, dumb bikes, I'd call them, um, and we kind of saw the Lime e-bike. Um, so Lime kind of first brought the e-bike to the streets, um, <laughs> and yeah, we, uh, we, we saw that. So that kind of paved the way for what I call the final frontier of micromobility. Um, so right now we have um, you know, shared e-scooters, shared e-bikes, and even shared e-mopeds on our streets. Um, and that's kind of where um, the state of micromobility kind of goes to uh, absolute crap. Um, so companies basically just dump these devices on the side of the street. Um, they have little to no oversight, um, and they end up in rivers, waterways, and basically just anywhere um, anywhere lithium-ion batteries aren't supposed to be. Um, so yeah, it's kind of bad. So uh, these are the devices that I'm going to be focusing on today. Um, so I focused most of my work on um, one vendor, which was uh, Segway 9Bot. And um, Segway kind of makes the majority of uh, these rental e-scooters for a lot of these companies. Um, so you've probably seen their, um, their products in um, various companies on the street in Brisbane and um, uh, New Zealand as well. Um, so they run uh, three different devices, um, but I'm only going to be showing two today because I don't have a third one. Um, so the first one I'm going to be, I'm going to be talking about is the uh, Gen 1 IoT, which is an NRF51 um, based device. Um, and the NRF51 is a Cortex M0. Um, and the device also has a SimCom 7600 module um, for actually communicating over 4G or whatever network it can access. And then the Gen 1, and then the Gen 2 IoT was kind of Ninebot's um, solution to making it look better. So they combined the IoT and the dashboard and added a whole bunch of more features. Um, 
they uh, changed it from an NRF51 to an STM32, um, and they use a Quicklink BG95 uh, to handle um, communication with uh, GPS and 4G as well. And Segway says uh, their Gen 2 IoT is very bad. Um, so bad that um, when I tried to buy them, they would actually refuse to sell them to me and instead um, tried to convince me to buy the Gen 1 IoT. So, yeah. So these scooters, um, these rental scooters have actually become so successful that most of the companies that are selling the uh, rental models have actually started making retail models as well. Um, so you've probably seen the Ninebot Max retail version absolutely everywhere. Um, JB Hi-Fi sells them, um, Harvey Norman sells them. Um, you, you can get them for about eight, nine hundred bucks, um, and they're great scooters. Um, so they're pretty much an almost um, kind of carbon copy of the rental model, if you will, um, just with a little less like beefed up parts. Um, and obviously it has a foldable stem um, and a bit of a reduced battery life, whereas the rental version um, uh, has a non-foldable stem, uh, its battery is replaceable, and it has an IoT module that can obviously communicate with um, our services as well. And the rental, mo the rental model is significantly heavier at about 35 kilos, whereas the retail model is only about 15 kilos. Um, so I don't know where all that weight comes from, but it's just a beefier scooter. So in my opinion, the, the, the rental version is, is the cooler scooter. So hence why we're here. Um, so now we kind of go into my motivation and why I hacked these, uh, why I hacked these devices. So my main motivation was to kind of curb the e-waste that was happening. So you can see in this picture here that th these are just scooters that have ended up in an electronics re recycler. And like this happens like so much, basically. So these companies will buy entire fleets of scooters and rent them out for six to nine months and then just liquidate, the, liquidate their current like scooters they have in, in a city. Um, and they'll liquidate them for basically scrap metal prices. Um, so uh, electronics recyclers will just buy these scooters up for scrap metal prices and they'll usually um, tr at least try to convert them into um, sellable uh, retail models uh, so that people can actually, you know, have a second hand use for them. Um, and there was not really much development or effort done into this um, kind of thing previously. Um, there has been a little bit of uh, uh, look into the uh, Lime IoTs, um, but that kind of didn't really go that far, and Lime's kind of um, really stepped up on their game um, since then as well. Um, so also, you know, assessing the security, I like, I, I, I ride these things, you know, I wanna know if someone can mess with me while I'm riding it. Um, and the answer is yes. Um, and um, obviously enhancing our functionality and control over retail models, so I have a retail scooter, I wanna have these cool rental features too, right? Um, which I can almost definitely do. Um, just by using this project, I can uh, basically bring uh, all of the rental features to my retail model, so that's pretty cool. So now we actually get into obtaining the rental hardware. So this is usually easier said than done. Um, you can find this hardware um, basically kind of in mishmash of different places. Um, so I found stuff on eBay, Facebook Marketplace. Um, actually, this this screenshot in the right hand side here um, is a very good deal on Ninebot Max scooters. If anyone's in Sydney um, and wants a sharing version, um, they're still on Facebook Marketplace, um, and I would buy one if I were you. Um, they're they're the IoT version. They're very cool. Um, so that's kind of where you find kind of the like rough um, most of the most of these devices. Um, you sometimes find um, like lots of these scooters on auction sites, um, and also police auctions in the U.S. Um, I kind of haven't really noticed it here, um, but in the U.S., um, their rental companies seem to have a really common theme of um, going to a town and dumping the scooters everywhere and not really paying um, council fees or anything, um, at which point um, the council will repossess them um, and then the rental, rental company doesn't really want to pay um, all this money to get their scooters back, right? So they just, you know, cut their losses and the city will sell these, uh, sell these lots off to uh, sometimes the rental company will try and buy them back. But yeah, so. This was kind of um, my first step. Um, so obviously um, we had to dump the firmware and actually see what we were working with. Um, so 
dumping the firmware was achieved uh, with a project called NRFSEC. Um, these NRF chips have readout protection enabled. Um, however, NRFSEC um, allows you to basically just bypass the readout protection and dump the chip anyway. Um, so, yeah. Um, NRFSEC does, for some reason, require a genuine STM32 uh, 32 chip on an ST-Link, um, which was much easier said than done. I bought about 15 of these devices, um, trying to search for one with a genuine chip, um, and I just couldn't, and then eventually I found one on AliExpress, so go figure. Um, so now that we have the firmware, um, now that we can, now we can actually, you know, analyze it and look at what we can do with this firmware. Um, so I'm not very good at arm reversal. Um, I'm not good at all. Um, so <laughs> my firmware analysis was kind of limited to basic um, kind of um, function and string analysis. Um, so I loaded uh, our firmware dump into Ghidra um, and just took a look at some strings, and I could already see like, quite a lot of stuff. Um, so, as it turns out, that was pretty much all I needed to get the device talking to my own server. Um, so I could just patch with Ghidra um, these different variables, so I patched the APN, hostname, and port, um, and then slotted in my own SIM card, um, powered it up, and this device was speaking to my own server. So um, yeah, it's quite easy to just physically attack these devices and put, you, put them on your own server, in theory. Um, so now we're talking, um, you know, what, 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 does, what do these devices speak? Um, well, it's a plain text TCP protocol um, with no authentication. Um, there is absolutely no checking if the client or server is legitimate. Um, the server and the client will just take whatever command it receives and just go, yep, okay, sure, you know, I'll, I'll run that. Um, there is a periodic heartbeat that's sent from the SCU to the server, but it doesn't really seem like it matters because um, the server can just ignore it and the scooter will just continue to function normally anyway. Um, and all this, uh, all this communication is easily listened to over the uh, SIM7600 modem RX and TX lines. Um, so if I wasn't able to get it onto my own server, um, I could just basically connect it to the original server um, and get some uh, communication that way as well. Um, and Newer models actually use MQTT with client and server certificate authentication, so that is a really good thing. Um, however, it's kind of irrelevant um, in what I'm about to discuss. Um, so basically, once I could talk to the device, I needed the protocol. So somehow the protocol has made itself onto Google. Um, you can search this one string on Google, and it is, this protocol is the only result that you will get, and it is basically all you need to um, essentially run your own IoT server um, and uh, run your own scooters that way. Um, and then in theory, with this older version of the protocol, um, one could, uh, again in theory, um, go to the uh, device vendor, um, and kind of request a new version of the protocol. And um, if the vendor believed you were a client, um, they, in theory, would give the new version to you. Um, so, yeah. Um, so now we're actually getting somewhere. You know, now we have the protocol. Um, we have the, both the TCP and the BLE protocol. You know, what can we actually do with this? Um, there is a lot of inf interesting information in these documents, um, from the data encryption process um, to basically just the entire TCP protocol. So this helped tremendously with just everything, essentially. Um, so now it's time to build something. Um, so I built. Um, I built what I called op opaque IoT. Um, I'm going to put it uh, open source on GitHub uh, sometime after this talk's done. Um, and basically what this platform is, is um, you can run your own rental company, essentially. Um, so if you get access to these devices, um, or if you happen to um, buy the Segway on Facebook Marketplace, like I said, um, you can connect these devices up to this platform and essentially have uh, full self-hosted control over your own scooter. Um, this platform isn't really like something that's um, even um, available to rental companies, um, because the protocol, like they charge uh, an exponential amount to even uh, like see the protocol essentially. Um, so yeah. 
Um, so now what? You know, um, now that I had um, now that I had the IoT actually talking to my server, what could I do now? Well, apps, of course. So I found this screenshot on the left um, on a uh, knowledge base of a company called Movatic. Um, Movatic kind of just does um, like small scale fleet. Um, uh, small scale like micro mobility fleet solutions and also white labeling. Um, and they had quite a lot of interesting information on this specific app. So from their knowledge base, I was able to find out that this app um, that they were showing uh, was called BLE Tool. And they would actually kind of show how to do certain functions like change the IP of the IoT. Um, do various commands like unlock the scooter, change the speed limit, and things like that. So obviously this app was very intriguing to me. So I wanted to learn more. So I found a download to this app just on the vendor's website. Um, and you can just download it and register. Now, once you register, you actually kind of get nowhere because the app requires a little test code to actually um, kind of get into the device control screen. And that's kind of the vendor's way of limiting who can access which devices. Um, so the vendor kind of has this theory with device keys where um, each, each one of their customers will have a different device key, and they control which um, customer can actually use that device key. However, in practice, stuff like that doesn't really work. So. Um, Basically, because I was able to log into the app and man in the middle of the responses, um, I could see and very easily understand what the app was looking for from the, uh, from the authentication server. So just by decompiling the app, I could see um, basic uh, JSON responses, so I could recreate that very easily. Um, and then also, while decompiling the app, I found quite a lot of uh, left behind test code, um, just some variables. Um, <laughs> Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah, I heard, I've read about that. Um, so, um, <laughs> I lost my flow there. Um, so, basically, these apps, um, when you de decompile them, you can see a whole lot of um, left behind test code from um, obviously when they were testing them. Um, and this test code kind of includes interesting stuff like default keys, um, some commands, and just basic like stuff that you would find interesting. So, um, obviously, from this kind of data, I could very easily recreate um, the expected data that the app expected. And um, on the right-hand side, uh, you can see I'm now actually in the app. So I've patched the app, and uh, now I can use it to connect to any uh, scooter that I want, uh, that I have the key for. Um, so wait a second, you know, there was, a, there was this device key there. What, what does the device key do? Well, the device key is used to, facili to facilitate communication between the IoT device and a BLE client. So um, essentially, it's just like the first line of defense. Um, this device key is changeable over BLE and TCP. Um, it is eight characters. Um, it has no symbols. Um, it is not changed very often. Um, it is hard-coded in apps, but it's always default. Always. Um, so what could one do with this? Well, now that we had uh, the app, um, well, now it was kind of time to you know, pair all these things together. So I had my own, rental, uh, no, my own retail scooter um, that I purchased from JB Hi-Fi. I had my IoT that I got from Electronics Re uh, Recycler. And I had my app, and I had my opaque IoT platform. So um, what does all of this look like together? Well. Doesn't look like much, but um, if you kind of know what you're looking at, um, this is, you know, the first steps to a uh, successful scooter hack. Um, so yeah, that's that's just kind of what I could do with my own personal device um, by this point. Um, so, oh, hold on. Um, so you know, what have we learned so far? So these types of IoT devices are absolutely everywhere, um, not just in scooters, but also e-mopeds and e-bikes as well. These vendor apps and also resources are out in public and quite obviously should not be. Um, these devices have a very large attack surface, both physically and BLE, and there's a lot of default key usage. And you're going to hear me say this quite a lot, but that there's a lot of default key usage. Um, but do we actually need the device key? Do we actually need this default key that apparently never changes? No, we don't. Um, so there's a vulnerability um, that I kind of noticed when I first saw the protocol specification. So initially, when the device um, 
uh, initially when a user connects to, um, to this IoT device over Bluetooth, um, the, uh, the user's phone will exchange a device key uh, for a communication key to actually issue any commands. Um, and you can see here that uh, the device key isn't actually used again except for reissuing a communication key um, after reconnecting. Um, the communication key is a maximum of three bytes long. It is all numbers. Um, it's semi, it seems to be semi-persistent, so it doesn't really change. Um, so essentially, we only need to try that number 999 times before we you know, get a successful um, command. But for some reason, this random number generator really liked two-digit numbers. Um, so it was more like 50-ish times um, that we had to try. Um, so there's another vulnerability, right? Um, and that vulnerability lies with a very interesting random number implementation. So when a client connects to a, uh, when a client um, is um, kind of doing authentication with a device, um, the client is supposed to generate a random number. And the device also does this exact same thing too. Um, it kind of just does it in reverse. Um, so this random number is generated uh, to actually uh, derive other keys from it and encrypt the, um, the entire Bluetooth um, packet. And it seems as though that the same source for this random number um, is also used for the communication keys random number. So I think you can see where this is going. Um, we can kind of make an attack where we can check the, we can check the random number um, if the random number is successful. Um, it, it's just going to let us run commands. So essentially, um, this is kind of like a flowchart um, of how, uh, how it was actually put into practice. Uh, so a nice little XKCD meme there. Um, so you can see we start out by purposely sending an incorrect device key to this device. The device will go, OK, it's incorrect. Um, here's a response to tell you it's incorrect. Um, it will encrypt that response with a random number. Um, and that random number was supposed to be the communication key, right? So what can we do with that? Well, we can test to see if that's correct. So there's a command called battery unlock, which only will, respond, uh, only will actually respond to the device if uh, it has a correct communication key. So we can just send this battery unlock command a bunch of times with a bunch of different random numbers, and eventually, um, it will just succeed and give us uh, the correct communication key. Um, so what can we do with something like this? Well, these devices have undocumented commands um, to handle upgrading firmware and firmware settings over BLE. Um, this can be theoretically leveraged. By, <laughs> this can th th be theoretically leveraged by an attacker to achieve a full takeover of this vehicle in seconds, even in the middle of a ride. Um, so I've got a bit of a demo. Um, so this, is, uh, this demo is kind of going through um, connecting to a device that I don't have the proper key to. Um, it's going to run the, uh, the random um, kind of number thing that I made. Um, and then it's going to check against uh, some battery commands. And then eventually, it's going to give us a successful, um, a successful communication key. Um, so I'll just play that now. So. Start out by uh, pressing get firmware info, and that's going to give us an error because we don't have the correct key, obviously. Um, so now I'm going to run the, um, the fail rand get key. Um, that's just going to try a bunch of times. And you see here, um, oops. Well, now, now you get the outcome, obviously. But um, <laughs> uh, so it's just going to run through that, uh, that random number thing a bunch of times um, until eventually it'll get a successful um, communication key. And from that, we can actually get the firmware information of this device. Um, so we can figure out what variables it's actually using um, to actually communicate. Um, so you can see here it's trying to communicate with a Segway server. But we can just send an update command to actually write different values to that. Um, so that's what I've just done now. And then now I'm requesting the new firmware information. And um, we've got a successful update. So um, this is the outcome of that. So we are able to modify the IP of this device without a device key while the device is on the street, in theory. Whoops. So um, 
let, let, let's kind of make some scenarios out of this. Well, with general commands, an attacker can stop someone's e-scooter, e-moped, or bike in the middle of the road, impose speed limits, um, and even more scary, they can speed up the throttle and disable the brakes. Um, some research on this was done by a company called Zephyrium in this blog post uh, down here. Um, this research was done on privately owned e-scooters. Um, so this, this, kind of, um, this kind of attack exists on not only rental scooters, but also privately owned scooters as well. Um, and they obviously say that maximum braking suddenly at 30 kilometers an hour on a vehicle is kind of bad. Um, that can kind of result in you going flying. Um, so, you know, it's a pretty bad attack. And then, yeah, this attack was demonstrated by a company called Zephyrium. And then these attacks are very reminiscent of car hacking. And I think we need to view these as more than just e-scooters. Um, and finally, Segway actually creates a three-wheeled AI-enabled self-driving scooter for some reason. Um, this scooter has the advertised capability of um, kind of uh, driving itself back to its um, home base, um, taking itself to a powering, to a recharging station, or just taking itself back to a parking spot. So I'm sure you can kind of guess where, what, what we can do with a self-driving AI vehicle that we have full control over, right? Um, if anyone's seen that South Park episode about the e-scooters, <laughs> Like I uh, mentioned in the, like I had a picture of in the uh, first slide, um, we can create quite a nuisance with these scooters. Um, so, you know, what if we just didn't want to hurt people? What if we wanted to, met, what if we wanted to, you know, do malicious attacks in theory, but not want to actually hurt people? Well, I mean, we can just install malware. Like, it's, it's a 4G enabled device with an internet connection, right? It's, it's essentially like, like a really good botnet target, in my opinion. Um, and somebody seemed to think, it, or it, somebody obviously seemed to think so, um, because Linebike had an issue with Mirai, um, a variant of Mirai attacking their IoT devices directly. Um, and uh, there are some uh, photos of their firmware um, with actual hard-coded IPs um, in some IP tables rules. Um, and obviously ransomware as well. Um, Everyone knows ransomware. You can, uh, in theory, ransom a whole fleet of scooters back to the rental company. Um, so yeah, that's the thing as well. And does anybody remember the Dallas Siren attack? Um, that was kind of funny. <laughs> um, someone just enabled every single one of Dallas's um, emergency alert sirens at, in the middle of the night. Um, I think it happened like multiple times as well. Um, now picture every e-scooter in Brisbane doing the same thing. These scooters have a pretty loud, um, pretty loud speaker on them um, if you've ever had one yell at you for doing something wrong. Um, so yeah, picture every scooter in Brisbane screaming unintelligible scooter dialogue. Um, honestly, kind of funny. Um, and mitigation, you know, what, what can we do? What, what can a company do to kind of mitigate these attacks? Well, obviously, hardware and software audits, um, that wouldn't really be that hard because, like, one can just look at these devices and realize that like, they're, they're incredibly vulnerable and people can get hurt. And don't use default, default keys, that kind of goes without saying, um, but unfortunately, um, people don't listen. Um, the default keys that are used um, in these scooters, you can find on um, like public, uh, public knowledge base, uh, public API documentation for Segway. Um, these, these keys are absolutely everywhere, um, and they are by no means secret. Um, encryption, so like we see in the new versions of the firmware where they're actually encrypting their, um, their traffic, um, obviously it should be encrypted between the server and the client, um, otherwise um, people like me happen. Um, and reduce your attack surface. You know, um, super glue the ITs in the scooter, for example. Like, you can't pull it out if it, if you can't like plug something into it if you can't pull it out, right? Um, and don't use default keys, um, yeah. And by the way, did I say don't use default keys? And yeah, that's, that's kind of all, folks. Um, so you know, you can find me on GitHub, uh, at Jamie Duke. Um, I'm on Twitter. Um, I don't use Twitter that much, um, at Jamie Duke E. Um, and then uh, special thanks to Scooter Hacking. Um, if you own a rental scooter, uh, no, if you own a retail scooter, sorry, um, and you want it to go uh, faster, um, sc yeah, scooterhacking.org. Thank you, everyone.